if you've been on the web page, um, did I take your seat? No. <laughs> if you've been on the if you've been on the web page, um, you see that I put uh, the grade thing up, right? The spreadsheet. Um, and you see from that that there are a lot of assignments that are missing, and some people have seen that and started to turn those assignments into me. So if you see that you have a missing assignment, um, then get that to me um, sooner rather than later. Um, the other thing uh, that I want to draw your attention to um, is the fact that I've uh, updated the squirrel tray data set. Um, there was one group that didn't have um, angles in, uh, they never got back to me, so I just substituted angles. Okay. So I just assumed they were at 45 degrees, uh, so your task is to turn in um, your task is to turn in um, your population density estimate for the squirrels uh, that we observed um, out of tap off part using program distance. Okay. Um, I think uh, with that um, and the assignments that, list, that are listed on there, once you have that completed, everything that's on there will be up to date. Everybody got their 10 points for the Dre data, right? I mean, if you participated. Um, so, uh, all things considered, then, your grade will look pretty good when all of those assignments are turned in, even if you did not do well on the exam. Uh, remember, the focus in the course is not so much on the exams, all uh, right, the exams are good and important and all of that sort of stuff, but even if you don't test well uh, or you have some poor exams, you can still do well in the class, right? Okay, um, hopefully uh, you've had a chance to look at those short little videos um, that are on the web page about the squirrel behavior. Um, these are two modules that are um, put together uh, by a couple of women from um, Colorado Mesa University, uh, Liz Flaherty at, uh, at Purdue, uh, who is a SEMO product, and then Haley Lanier um, in Oregon. Uh, so these four women got together and got an NSF grant uh, to develop these modules. Um, and they are amassing this data set, which is quite large, um, on squirrel behavior from across the U.S. So uh, everything from desert habitats to um, boreal forests and so on. And it's sort of a cool data set. And what you're going to do is contribute to that data set. Uh, there are two modules. There is one, well, actually, there are four modules. We're going to do two of them. Uh, one is simply on behavior. Um, the other one is also kind of behavior too, but it's optimal foraging. Um, and that's why I was having you get those seed data, right? And some of you have started to turn that stuff in. Uh, we will need those data when we begin that optimal foraging part of it. Uh, the nice thing is that even if we go into COVID shutdown, uh, we'll be able to continue that work regardless. Uh, and the same is true for the behavior data. Uh, so I'm sort of in a scramble trying to get all of the necessary in-class stuff out of the way uh, so that we can do, even if we go into shutdown, we can get that stuff, that, that stuff done remotely. Uh, so beginning with the behavior data, you've looked at the video for the marmots, and you've done a little ethogram and sequential thing for the marmots. Uh, you've done the same thing for the... Um, uh, for your gray squirrels, and you've done the same thing for the prairie dogs. I have hundreds of hours of video uh, for the marmots, hundreds of hours of video for the prairie dogs. Um, so, um, uh, I also have all of those data analyzed and whatnot, and all the transition matrices constructed. We're going to go back and develop the transition matrices for your gray squirrel data. I'll show you how to do that next week sometime. And then uh, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to compare your gray squirrel data with 
your, with the data that we have already computed and whatnot for the marmots and for the prairie dogs. So you'll be able to see how this tree squirrel differs from two species of ground squirrels. Uh, the tree squirrels are not social. Uh, Yellow-bellied marmots and prairie dogs are social. So it's confounded, right? Do the, are the differences that you see a consequence of arboreality? Or are they a consequence of sociality? So that's something that we will have to tease apart in some way. But you've looked at those videos, and what we've been concentrating on is sequence. Sequence. There we go. Um, because, in my view, uh, behaviors aren't independent. Okay, uh, you don't. When when you do certain things, you always do them in sequence. Okay, uh, you put your pants on before you put your shoes on. You know, unless you have really weird pants or something. Okay, um, but there's a certain sequence to how you do things. You get into your car, and then you turn the engine on, right? You don't turn the engine on and then get into your car. So it's always first one thing, and then another thing. The same is true for all sorts of other animals and for all sorts of other behaviors that you do, right? Um, so we have to take that into consideration when we're exploring animal behavior. The women that have set up this project, right, because this sort of sequential stuff is so difficult, right? They've taken a step back and said, okay, we're going to have to simplify it just a little bit in a way that's going to be consistent across all of these different universities and colleges across the country, right? To get something that we can compare, recognizing that there are difficulties. So that's what we're doing. We're taking a step back. We're going to come back and look at that sequence stuff. But for right now, we're just going to look at the behaviors. And I have here the data set that you will use, or the, the data sheet that you're going to use. I apologize for the small print. Uh, this is the data sheet that was developed by these four women. And I would like to point out that um, each and every one of these women is like really, really scary smart, okay? And each and every one of them is a truly fine human being as well. I think there are two pages in there. Don't get old when you're thing. When you get old, your fingers don't work quite so well. All right. All right. <laughs> And I hope your eyes work better than mine, because I can hardly read this stuff. Uh, what I may do is I may rework this data sheet so that the font is a little bit larger, but I can still squeeze down to one page. Can you guys read everything that's on here with your youthful, good, excellent eyeballs? Yeah, yeah good. Awesome. You can help me out then. All right. Uh, so when you look at this data sheet, uh, you need to fill in each of these things. So the name of the observer, name of the partner, if applicable. What I would like is for people to work in pairs. Okay? I know that some of you don't want to do that because of COVID. Okay? I know there's a uh, woman in uh, my Friday lab um, that has um, uh, family members that are immunocompromised and it would be irresponsible for her to show up in class so she will likely work on her own um, unless you do it remotely or something. The reason we want two observers if possible is so that one person can time, you know, call out the time and the other person can make the observation, right? It's just going to make life so much easier. Also, uh, in some places, probably not on campus or at the park or something, but if you're somewhere else doing these observations, uh, you'll probably feel safer uh, if there's another person there with you to say, hey, here comes the grizzly bear. Okay, no grizzly bears in Missouri. Um, but hey, here comes the cougar or something like that. Okay, so, or here comes that weird, creepy guy, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so if you can, work in a pair. Um, then your institutional affiliation, that's not going to have any effect at all on, on your data. 
uh, but it will help uh, these women as they develop um, this study. And then your email address, the, the primary observer, right, so that we can, um, if there are questions about the data, they have a way of contacting you and figuring out what was going on. Uh, next, location information, uh, latitude and longitude, uh, and you need to use WGS84, okay? So it's going to be to five decimal places for latitude and longitude. Uh, there, if you look at the videos, they indicate that there are a variety, and they offer a variety of different free apps for your smartphone uh, so that you can get lat launch. You can use your phone as a you know, GPS device, and uh, they give you that information. Then, uh, you need to indicate what sort of habitat you are in, so circle one of those. You're not in a desert grassland. Uh, you are not in a coniferous forest unless you're unless you're going over to the Appalachians or something to do this. Uh, if you're in the Ozarks, if you decide you want to do this in the Ozarks, or you're going to spend a day out, you know, at your cabin in uh, in the Ozarks, uh, that's sort of a mixed coniferous forest. So um, the Ozarks are a mixture of hardwood deciduous and conifers. Uh, whether you're in a deciduous forest, which is where most of us are, a riparian habitat, which would be along a stream or something like that, or I guess you could say even in a swamp. Agricultural system, if you're on the family farm, okay. On a college campus, in an urban area, okay, so which would be like uh, Kapaw Park or something like that, and or other. Okay, so if it's a... Uh, you know, the tundra, that would be other. Okay, if you are in an alpine fell field, that would be something else. If you are, you know, in the, above the tree line, that would go under other. Okay? And then I'm, unless you guys are way more special than I imagined, I don't think any of you are going to do this in the tundra or above the tree line, but it would be awesome if you did. All right, um, current conditions, so time. Um, day 10 time, so indicate at what day of the, at what, not only what day you're doing this, but at what time you're doing this, so, and indicate whether it's a.m. or p.m. Cloud cover, and this is just very broad, um, none, no cloud cover, mostly sunny, partly cloudy, mostly cloudy, overcast, whatever. Precipitation, is it, is there some form of precipitation, yes or no? Uh, so is it snowing, is it raining, is it misting, okay? Uh, wind, no wind, light breeze, steady breeze, gusty, strong wind. Uh, and then your behavioral observations. So now you have to indicate which species you're working on. Okay, so genus and species. We're going to do this on either gray squirrels or fox squirrels. If you're out in the Ozarks, uh, you'll probably be doing fox squirrels, okay? Uh, for gray squirrels, the genus is Cyrus, and the species is Carolinensis. If you're working on fox squirrels, it's Cyrus um, Niger. If you're working on red squirrels, Okay, which we don't have here in southeast Missouri. It's Tamia cyrus. Hudsonicus. If suddenly the Mississippi River freezes over solid, we may get a couple of red squirrels coming over from Illinois. Okay. Uh, if you're working on chipmunks, Right, if you're so lucky as to work on chipmunks, it's Eutanius minimus. All right, so then uh, you're going to begin your behavioral observations. Okay, so your partner is going to say start. So that's time zero, zero. And then you're going to look at which of these behaviors the animal is doing. So the behaviors are vigilance, foraging, alert, feeding, okay, so it's alert, it's paying attention, but it's feeding, social, other, or 
not applicable, okay? So something else. And you circle one of those at each 20 second interval, okay? And you're gonna do that for five minutes. So that means in every minute you're doing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four observations, right? One, two, three, well, three, four to three. So overall, you're going to do 16 observations, okay? So then you're gonna circle, you're gonna count up at the bottom there where it says total, how many times in that five minute interval was the animal being vigilant? How many times was it foraging? How many times was it alert and feeding? How many times was it being social, right, and so on? I think uh, what may happen, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I may split that alert and feeding. I will look into that. That may be an error, okay? That is the information together with the location and weather information that you're going to record, right, on the, on the database when it comes time to do that, all right? So, next thing, other animals that are present within 30 meters of your focal animal, so within 100 feet of your focal animal. So if there's another species like a dog, or a house cat, um, a red-tailed hawk, you know, a coyote comes along, a fox, red fox or gray fox, indicate what species it is, how many, if it's people walking by, okay, how many people were walking by, were there interactions, okay, within 15 meters of the social or of the focal animal? Yes or no, okay? So did the dog chase the squirrels? Okay, were there conspecifics? In other words, were there other gray squirrels around? Or if you're working on chipmunks, were there other chipmunks around? Were there humans around? Yes or no? Were there dogs around? Yes or no? Okay? So that's the data sheet. You now have a sense of the sort of data that you have available to you. Once you get those data, and we've all turned it in, we will then have access to that database, and we can use our data to compare it with data from other institutions. So that then leads us to the crux of the biscuit, so to speak. We want to develop hypotheses right, for what's going to happen. So this is where the science part comes in. It's not just collecting the data and sorting buttons and washing glassware. We're trying to address a question. Yeah, question. Yeah, so when we're taking the observations, are we just supposed to circle the one that they're doing, like, the majority of that? Time? No, no, no. So it's 20 seconds. You look and the squirrel is just being alert. You circle alert. Okay. So it's, you saw it, what was it doing right at that moment? At the 20 at that, at that 22nd point. You don't care what it did right before, right after. We're not doing the sequence. Yeah. It's what it's doing right now. All right. Okay? Yeah. All right. So, we want, we're asking the question, Okay. We have some question about what's influencing the behavior of these squirrels. This is the hardest part of the whole process. What I want you to do is work in pairs. I want each pair to develop their own question. So if your work, if Billy Bob is working with Joe Bob, okay, you're going to go through this at least twice. Once. Billy Bob is going to be the primary guy, and Joe Bob is going to help, calling out the times. Then you're going to switch. Joe Bob is going to make the observations, and Billy Bob is going to call out the time. Okay? So each student is going to record these data. We may ask that you do it multiple times. So instead of having just five minutes of observations, we may ask that you have many more minutes. We'll think about that. Okay? I have a conference, you know, calls with these people to try and figure out exactly, once we have your hypotheses, how we should proceed at that point. So, 
throw that one away. We'll save you that. So the questions are, when we have questions, remember from the very beginning part of the class, we have to think about our research hypothesis, and then we have to think about our null hypothesis and our alternate hypothesis. Okay? So our research hypothesis is broad and general. The null and alternate hypotheses are very specific. These two hypotheses are mutually exclusive. That is, only one of them can be true. Uh, but what is truth? That which is consistent with fact and reality. Okay? So these things are mutually exclusive, and they're narrow. Whichever one of these turns out to be accepted is going to tell you something about your research hypothesis. But the veracity of these things does not guarantee the veracity of this. Okay? So this is broader and more general than these two. What I want you guys to do today is develop your research hypothesis and your pair of alternate and null hypotheses. Okay? So you're going to have a pair here. You're going to have an alternate and a null, which are going to be more narrowly focused, something that you can test compared to this. So what sorts of things can you do? You can look at habitat. You can look at disturbance. You can look at seasons. You can compare species. You can look at weather. You can look at time. Right? These are all things that are on this data sheet. In other words, do the squirrels behave the same in the morning? as they do in the evening, or is it as they do in the middle of the day. Does that depend on season? Do squirrels in the middle of summer or in the middle of spring behave the same as squirrels right before winter? Do squirrels change their behavior dependent on weather? Do they behave differently when it's cold than when it's warm? Okay, and is that difference the same in the fall as it is in the summer? Why? There's the other thing. Why would you expect that? Well, let's think about that. Why is the ant? What are the gray squirrels doing right now? Gathering up as much food as possible. Yeah, they are scatter hoarders and larder hoarders. Scatter and larder. Hoarding. How do you spell hoarding? A R A R D. Yeah. I, I was fifth grade spelling bee champ, by the way. I reached that pinnacle and I said, that's good enough. Don't need to go any more. Okay. Alright. Hey, so what are they what are they picking up? What are they hoarding? Yeah, which, what kind of, so they're, they're hoarding hard mass. Give me an example of hard mass. Walnuts. Walnuts. Acorns. Pecans. What else? Hickory nuts. Acorns come in two flavors, right? They're black, black oak acorns, or sometimes referred to as red oak acorns, and white oak. 
right hand. Make it a letter W point. What's the difference? The bark on the tree. Pardon? The bark on the tree. Yeah, but in terms of the acorn, uh, the size, how are the acorns different? Is it the size of them? Uh, not really. Oh, uh, the white ones drop, or, or the black, the white ones drop earlier in the year, don't they? Uh, not necessarily. So, who likes wine? One person. <laughs> you prefer red or white? More of a rosé. Okay. <laughs> so, I went to this restaurant once, and the guy I was with uh, wanted some rosé. And, and the waitress says, um, well, what would you like me to mix? And he goes, mix? He says, yeah, which white wine would you like me to mix with which red wine? So their rosé, they were going to half and half, you know, half red, half white, which red and which white, you were, and you're going, uh, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between a red wine and a white wine? White sweeter. Color of grapes, of grapes used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of the taste, what's different? You can get a sweet red wine, you can get a sweet white wine, you can get a very dry red wine, you can get a very dry white wine. Which one has sort of a tangy taste to it? The red wine. Okay, why is that? Because the red wine is loaded with tannins. Black oak acorns are loaded with tannins. White oak acorns are not. Okay? What are the tannins? The tannins are what the tree uses to prevent depredation by insects. So black oak acorns have a bitter taste, but the insects basically leave them alone. The white oak acorns have a very nicer taste, much nicer taste to them, but the insects also feed on them. So what the squirrel is doing when it's out there hoarding, it finds a white oak acorn, it immediately eats it. it finds a black oak acorn, it stores it because the black oak acorn will last all winter long. The white oak acorn, it's not going to be there halfway through the winter because the insects will have consumed it. Okay? It's like this one you have to store in the this one you have to store in the refrigerator and the freezer to keep it fresh. This one you can store on the shelf. Okay? So the squirrels are taking the one that can store, they store that one. The one that's perishable, they consume that one. All right. So there's a different. How's about black? How's about black walnuts? How do you know the squirrels have been feeding on black walnuts? You can always tell when they've been feeding on black walnuts. What do their faces look like? Huge. <laughs> their their faces are all, their faces are a mess. It's all slimy and black and stuff. Their heads are just all nasty looking because they've been handling these big nasty black walnuts and all that crud is all over their faces. Okay. All right. So you can tell by you don't have to record that data, but you can tell what they're feeding on. Okay. So what I want you to do now is to work in groups. Let's decide who our pairs are. How many people do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We have 13 people. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Is there anybody that wants to work? That, is there anybody in here that's, God, I hate effing people. You know, just please, God, let me work alone. Nobody's like that. <laughs> In spite, in spite of my, my making it sound like such an awful thing, like you're such a pathetic loser and whatnot. But no, really, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, you're, you're more than welcome to 
um, just sit in with another group to help you develop an hypothesis, if you would like. What I want you to do is, for the next 15 minutes or so, work with a partner and develop a basic research hypothesis. And from there, we're going to develop our alternate and null hypotheses. Okay? So, who do you want to work with? You don't care? No, you do care, but you're too, you're too shy to say, oh, I, yeah, no, it's all right. Anybody have a specific person they want to work with? I'd like to work with Monique. Okay, you two guys. Yeah, well, Monique, you want to work with her? <laughs> okay, so you got, um, let's arrange this so you're not, you know, like breathing right on each other. If you can keep six foot distance, okay, that would be good. Uh, so we can move, well, no, we're not supposed to move the tables around. Uh, but you, what you might do is sit at opposite ends of the long way of the table, okay? Uh, anybody else has a... Right. Okay, you two guys, so you're going to sit at opposite ends of a table. So that that's four people. Who else? That's five people we've got taken care of. Who else has a specific person? Yeah. Would you rather work with a female or a male? Which one? Yeah, <laughs> Okay. You two guys work together. I mean, I don't if... No, I don't want to work with some woman. I just think <laughs> they're too difficult or something. Okay, good. All right. Let's see. That takes care of... Who do you want to work with? Or with Alex. Okay, you two guys. Who does that leave us? Raise your hand if you've not yet. So one, two, three, four. You four guys? Okay, any preference among you? Nobody wants to go first? You two guys? All right, it's by default, you two guys. Okay? Oh, no, man, I hate that dude. <laughs> okay, so change your location. Why don't you come up here and sit across on opposite ends of this table? Keep your chairs yeah. distant as much as you can so you're not breathing on the other person. Now it's recorded. Okay. How could you do it? So the issue is, right, are the animals going to feed more or be more vigilant when it's cold than when it's warm? You'd have to do several studies at different times of years. Well, we're, we don't have different times of years. We just have a couple of weeks. We still need to answer the question. So you might have a warm day, you might have a cool day, a cold day. And we are going to have a couple of warm days. This is the perfect time of year for that. And a couple of cold days. So we have to make sure that we're doing it at the same time, right? Because we don't want to confound it with time of day. So if we're going to do it at 10 o'clock in the morning, okay? for 20 minutes on one day and 20 minutes on a warmer day or something like that, how can we set it up so that we tease apart the effect of necessity to feed from necessity to be vigilant? Well, again, you could compare an area where it's necessary to be vigilant with an area where it's not quite so necessary to be vigilant, right? An area where there's a lot of disturbance by people or other animals versus an area where there's not a lot of disturbance by people or animals. So now you have four different things that you're, that you're four different, I guess, treatments that you're comparing. One treatment is high disturbance, cold, low disturbance, cold, high disturbance, warm, low disturbance, warm. And that way you can tease apart disturbance from temperature. Does that make sense? Okay. Gray squirrels are more vigilant in a natural system than in a human-dominated system. What's, what are human-dominated systems referred to? Anthropogenic systems. Okay. So where, where should they be more vigilant? Non-human dominated system. 
okay, potentially because there are more predators, all right? Uh, so more possible coyotes, more possible foxes, more possible hawks, and so on. Okay, so if you're in a forest, there are more bad guys around than if you're on a college campus. College students generally don't go screaming, running after squirrels. Whoever college students, I come by with my dog all the time on weekends. My dog sees a squirrel, I take the dog off the leash, and it's a thing of glory. <coughs> Trees that squirrel just like that, barks her silly head off, wants desperately to get at that squirrel, can't climb the tree. So it's all cool. Okay, so what might work against that? Well, what you're depending on is habituation in the squirrel to humans, right? So you're going to have to pay attention to the difference between humans and dogs or other potential human-induced predators. All right, feeding time will increase in open habitats. Why do you think that? Who's have, whose hypothesis is that? Why do you think they'll spend more time feeding in an open habitat? There's less food available. Yeah, because there's going to be less mast available. Okay? So that makes sense. Uh, what are some possible conflicting things that might interfere with that hypothesis? If it's open and they're more susceptible to like hawks and stuff like that. Yeah, so predation is they're a lot more so they might have to be more vigilant in the open habitat because the distance to safety is greater. So as they're more vigilant, they might have less time to feed. Mm -hmm. So that's one possible conflict. What's another conflict? What's the availability of food in the open habitat? Less. What's the density of squirrels in the open habitat? Less. They are tree species, right? They are an arboreal species. So in the forest habitat, they might end up feeding more just because there are more of them and therefore less food to go around. So how are you going to deal with that? Now you don't know whether it's because they're open in the open habitat or if it's because of the density of the squirrels. We were thinking like, fruit-bearing fruit trees over than just like trees in like a broad category? In the fall though, in the fall, how many, how many pear trees, apple trees, cherry trees still have fruit on them? I guess more nut-bearing trees. Yeah, so they're going to pay attention to the hard mass species, right? The maples aren't, none of the soft mass species are producing. The only thing that's producing right now is hard mass. What's another possible conflict with being in a forest system? Who else is eating acorns? Deer. Deer. Okay, and pigs. So how can you get around that? You might have to look at a couple of different sites. Maybe one site that has that's closed and has a high density of squirrels, one site that's closed has a lower density of squirrels, and then a site that is open, something like that. Okay. Have we gone through all of them? Oh, feeding will be greater in the morning than in the afternoon or in the evening. Why might that be? Why would you expect them to feed more in the morning than in the afternoon or in the evening? More predation at night. Pardon? More predation later in the evening. Who's going to feed on gray squirrels at night? Owls. They're safely in their drays, man. They're not moving around. Snakes? No, the black rat snakes are active during the day. And plus, I'm not sure a black rat snake would take a gray squirrel. We could certainly kill it, but I'm not sure if you could consume it. I've, I've never seen it. I've seen him take bigger things, but never as big as a squirrel. What's different about them? All right, so when are most animals active? When are deer most active? What's that called? 
nocturnal is when you're active at night. Okay? If you wanted to go see deer in Cape, you know exactly you'd go to the corner of Burbling and Sprig. Alright? When are you most likely to see deer there? In the evening and in the early morning. So that's called crepuscular. Why is that? Why are most animals crepuscular? All right, so in the middle of the night, you're down in your hole, you're nice and safe and toasty warm, and predators can't get to you, but damn, you're hungry. You've got that long day in front of you where you can't be active because you're nocturnal, so you come out and feed one last time, and then go back to safety. Now you've been stuck in your hole all day long. Damn, you're hungry. hungry. The sun goes down. Come out and feed a little bit. Fill up your belly. Go back in your hole. Be safe. That's why most animals are crepuscular. Whether you're nocturnal or diurnal, most animals tend to feed morning and evening. Okay, so now, why would it be different for a gray squirrel in the morning versus the evening? be a difference because they're going to be hungry regardless? Would it be that the night's longer than the daylight? Oh, so there's, there's a good idea. So right. it's a longer period yeah. that they're going without food? Yeah, right now the nights are longer than the days. So in the morning they will have gone longer, so they might be hungrier. That's a good idea. What else might be influencing it? What are the temperatures like? in the morning versus the evening. It's colder in the morning. It's colder in the morning. The plant has been cooling off all night long, and all day long it's been warming up. So the coldest time of the night, the coldest time every day, is shortly before dawn. Okay? So there might be two things going on. One is temperature, one is time how long you've gone since your last meal. So how could you deal with the temperature part? Do evening and morning observations on a warm day, evening and morning observations on a cold day. Okay? All right, sound like a good starting point? Okay, your assignment then is I want you to write down on a piece of paper, you're not gonna turn it in today, but we will collect it later. Write down your hypothesis, okay? Think about where you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, how many five minute intervals you're going to need, okay? How you're going to analyze the data, right? We've not talked about statistics or anything of that sort, but think how you would compare the data to come at your conclusion. Try and get a little bit of information out of the literature. You might Google, on Google Scholar, squirrel feeding or squirrel foraging or squirrel vigilance or gray squirrel vigilance, something like that. Find a little bit of source material to refine your thinking. Okay? We all good? All right, good. See you guys next time.